Thank you for listening to the well Road Christian Podcast. I'm Mark Stanley, your host, and today we are continuing our examination of Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago. Last episode, we went through an overview of early Soviet history and Solzhenitsyn's role in the downfall of a real-life dystopia. In this episode, we're going to look closer at the beginning of Solzhenitsyn's intellectual and spiritual journey, where he describes himself as a naively enthusiastic youth, caught up with the cares of this world and the hubris of groupthink. When everyone around you thinks the same way, it's very easy to lack the humility to truly listen uh, or understand opposing viewpoints. Solzhenitsyn eventually learned that if he had been more humble and listened more often, he would have seen through the collective lies of groupthink and saved himself a tremendous amount of suffering. Thank you again for listening to the Well-Read Christian Podcast. If you enjoy our show, please like our Facebook page, follow us on Instagram or Twitter, and most importantly, leave a review on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or however you're listening. If you like me and what I'm doing, you can seriously help my project by leaving a five-star review and leaving a few of your thoughts. Finally, if you have benefited from the podcast or believe in our mission, you're welcome to make a tax-deductible donation to support our work on our website, wellreadchristian.com. There, you'll also find interesting quotes, sources, articles, and more available free of charge. If your contribution would cause any amount of financial trouble, please do not even consider it. But for those who are willing and able to give, it is because of your gift that the podcast can continue and even grow. So thank you. It's a quiet, warm, moonlit evening, and Alexander Solzhenitsyn is with his wife. They are young and in love, fresh out of college. Every night, they would go over to Mr. and Mrs. Bronovitsky's porch, and they would smoke and talk about whatever was on their minds. In only a few months, those peaceful skies would be rent by the rumble of planes and exploding bombs, but for now, the German advance was far off. Trainloads of refugees spilled out of the local train station to stretch their legs on their way to Stalingrad. The refugees came bearing news of which latest towns have surrendered, since the Information Bureau was always slow to tell the people the truth. Bronovitsky always spoke of the towns as being taken, not as having been surrendered. The milky sky and defenseless moon watched in silence as the two couples enjoyed each other's company. Mr. Bronovitsky was an engineer who had already spent years in the communist prison system. That's how he met Mrs. Bronovitsky. It was incredibly dangerous for him to tell the Solzhenitsyns anything about the forced labor camps. Bronovitsky had lost his health in the prison camps since the water was poisoned by copper. He tried to tell Alexander Solzhenitsyn about the murder rates and the horrid working conditions and how complaints written to Moscow were completely ignored but it was dangerous for him to say anything, and so he only gave a tiny peep into his past and expanded on it whenever Alexander would mention it or, or seem interested. Every now and then, Mr. Bronovitsky would say something that sent shivers up Alexander's spine. But did it have the slightest effect on his perspectives, how he saw the government or the world? Of course not. He was still young and naive. He couldn't process the new information. It was foreign to his worldview. Solzhenitsyn says that him and his wife would prefer to talk about themselves and their anxieties for the future. They didn't have anything more intelligent to say than what could be read about in the papers, but they preferred to recycle the talking points from the news rather than listen to the Bronovitskys for what they were really saying. The Solzhenitsyns barely noticed that the Bronovitskys were trying to build enough of a rapport, enough trust, that they could actually share what was really happening and had happened in their own lives. The Solzhenitsyns didn't notice their small hints or tiny pauses. Quote, They asked what we remembered best about 1938 and 1939. What do you think we said? The university library, exams, the fun we had on sporting trips, dances, amateur concerts, and of course, love affairs. But hadn't any of our professors been put away at that time? Yes, we suppose that two or three of them had been. Their places were taken by senior lecturers. What about students? Had any of them gone inside the archipelago? We remembered that some senior students had indeed been jailed. And what did you make of it? Well, nothing. We carried on dancing. And no one near you was touched? No, no one. Solzhenitsyn goes on, quote, It is a terrible thing, and I want to recall it with absolute precision. It is all the more terrible because I was not one of the young sporting and dancing sort, nor one of those obsessive people buried in books and formula. I was keenly interested in politics from the age of 10. 
Even as a shallow adolescent, I did not believe in Ashinsky and was staggered by the fraudulence of the famous trials. But nothing led me to draw the line connecting those minute Moscow trials, which seemed so tremendous at the time, with the huge, crushing wheel rolling through the land, the number of its victims somehow having escaped notice. I had spent my childhood in queues for bread, for milk, for meat. Meat was a thing unknown at that time. But I could not, I could not make the connection between the lack of bread and the ruin of the countryside, or understand why it even had happened. We were provided with another formula, temporary difficulties. Every night in the large town where we lived, hour after hour, people were being hauled off to jail. But I did not walk the streets at night. And in the daytime, the families of those arrested hung out no black flags, nor did my classmates say a word about their fathers being taken away. According to the newspapers, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. And young men are so eager to believe that all is well. End quote. Alexander would go off into the army not too shortly after that conversation. The porch that they were sitting on was under German occupation very quickly. He remembers opening a letter from his wife at the front lines after that town had been liberated, and his wife told him that Mr. Bonavitsky had worked with the Germans while they were occupied. Filthy thing to do, he thought. Quote, but a few more years went by, lying on the sleeping platform in some dark jail and turning things over in my mind. And I remembered Mr. Bronovitsky, and I was no longer so schoolboyishly self-righteous. They had unjustly taken his job from him, given him work that was beneath him, locked him up, tortured him, beat him and starved him, spat in his face. What was he supposed to do? He was supposed to believe that all of this was the price of progress, and that his own life, physical and spiritual, the lies of those dear to him, the anguished lies of, the, of our whole people, were of no significance. End quote. Solzhenitsyn would look back at this time and remember that they couldn't see things for how they were because politicians like Stalin did a good job at having a friendly and believable face. And he wasn't interested in critically analyzing things and trying to get to the heart of the truth at that time. He was busy. And the newspapers did not honestly report what was really happening. Some people saw through the lies and, and the propaganda and didn't believe the, the government's messages and, and the press but those people kept silent. They unplugged their radios in disgust and skipped over the politics section of the newspaper. And then when polling day came around, they would further be led into the belief that they were in the minority, completely alone. Stalin has a famous quote, I consider it completely unimportant who will vote, or how, but what is extraordinarily important is this, who will count the votes, and how. So the polls would come out that Stalin was... Uh, massively supported by the people, and uh, lots of neighbors and people were outspoken about their support, and uh, lots of young people, everyone in academia. And so nobody said anything for fear that they would be alone when they cried out against the masses. And the masses were vocal. Uh, like I said, the universities, the intellectuals who were writing the books, uh, professors, the so-called working class were all praising Stalin and the Communist Party for their brilliant policies and their revolutionary leadership. Meanwhile, food shortages became commonplace, and the few who did speak out against the government were silenced, spied on, arrested, blackmailed, and murdered. Ordinary people either kept to themselves or were naive and enthusiastic for their own lives, just like Solzhenitsyn. They didn't care to make the connection or try to uncover the truth or investigate what was really happening in, at the governmental level. They didn't think about the food shortages and the arrests nor did they think that they were a direct result of communist policies. But then again, why should you care if people disagree with you or being silenced? Martin Nomoller was a bishop in Germany who fought for the Germans in World War II, but he had a soft spot for Christian freedom. When Hitler started going after the churches, he was shocked. Quote, First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out, because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. End quote. Instead of being focused on the corruption and the hatred that was swelling in Russia, people like Solzhenitsyn focused on other people like Mr. Bronovitsky. How could he join the Germans against his own people? 
filthy thing to do. I'm going to draw two lessons here. The first is that we need to learn to listen to people with humility. This is a huge part of why Solzhenitsyn wrote in the first place and why he remembered his interactions with Mr. Bronowitzki even after decades. Because in the end, Solzhenitsyn looked back and he said, you know what? Mr. Bronowitzki was right. And I didn't listen to him when I had the chance because I was self-righteous and naive and I didn't want to believe that what had happened to Mr. Bronowitzki could have happened to anyone or, or, or really even listen to Mr. Bronowitzki's experiences. I didn't want to believe what he was telling me about the prison system. I didn't want to believe what he was telling me about the food shortages or, or their causes or about the disappearances of certain conservative voices. Alexander lacked the humility to listen, and he lacked the wisdom to see that Bronowitzki was a valuable resource to learn from. If he would have looked him in the eyes and actually heard his story, he might have been more prepared when he himself was arrested. If enough young people listened to people like Bronowitzki, Russian history might have been much different. The second point I want to make is tied to the first, uh, which is to extend our humility uh, not just to elders and older adults and, and just people who've been around uh, and people we disagree with, most importantly, but also we should extend our humility to the past. If we are humble, we recognize that we are not as wise as we should be and that we have a lot to learn from people who've lived before us. G.K. Chesterton has a great quote. He says, quote, Tradition means giving votes to the most obscure of all classes, our ancestors. It is the democracy of the dead. Tradition refuses to submit to the small and arrogant oligarchy of those who merely happen to be walking about. End quote. Every generation is tempted to believe that their wisdom and insight surpasses all previous generations. But the truth is, is that every achievement made today stands on the shoulders of achievements made by our ancestors. And all the mistakes that we make today are mistakes that we have inevitably failed to learn from our ancestors. So between the brilliant men and women in the distant or recent past, or the more seasoned adults around us, which are rich deposits of wisdom that we will miss out on if we instead prefer to be self-righteous and arrogant, we have ample opportunity to be humble and to listen, not just to people who we agree with, but also with people that we disagree with, because then we might actually learn something. Solzhenitsyn was self-absorbed, so he didn't listen to Bronowitzki. He preferred to just villainize him, instead of understand him, and he suffered unnecessarily for it. Alexander would carry his pride and self-absorption into the army only a few months later. He was an officer, of course. He had a degree in physics and mathematics from a reputable school. He's not a simple grunt. Recalling this time, Solzhenitsyn writes that he enjoyed the happiness of simplification, being a military man and not having to think things through. The military milieu is that you follow orders and you forget some of the spiritual subtleties inculcated since childhood. Still, he was good at his job, and he was twice decorated for his service. He enjoyed being an officer. He enjoyed giving orders. Listen to Solzhenitsyn's later reflections on what he was like as an officer. Quote, Pride grows in the human heart like lard on a pig. I tossed out orders to my subordinates that I would not allow them to question, convinced that no orders could be wiser. Even at the front, where one might have thought death made equals of us all, my power soon convinced me that I was a superior human being. While seated, I would have them stand at attention. I interrupted them. I issued commands. I addressed fathers and grandfathers with the familiar, downgrading form of address, while they, of course, addressed me formally. I forced my soldiers to put their backs into it and dig me a special dugout at every new bivouac, and to all the heaviest support beams to support it, so that I should be as comfortable and safe as possible. They sewed me a map case from a car seat, but I didn't have a strap for it, and I was unhappy about that. Then all of a sudden, they saw a partisan commissar from the local, party, the local district party committee wearing just the right kind of strap, and they took it away from him. We are the army. We have seniority. Finally, I coveted a scarlet box, and I remember how they took it from the family and got it for me. That's what shoulder boards do to a human being. And where have all the exhortations of grandmother standing before an icon gone? And where are the young pioneers' daydreams of a future sacred equality? End quote. 
Human beings do enjoy power, don't we? Later, we'll see Solzhenitsyn talk about how we shouldn't judge ourselves based on our actions. We should judge ourselves based on our character. It's easy to excuse our actions to ourselves, but unless we have built an impressive wall of self-deception, we should be able to look at ourselves and see if we might enjoy the thrill of superiority and power in a similar situation. But Solzhenitsyn's days as an officer did not last long. The government read and censored every letter that was sent by anybody in the nation, without them knowing about it, and Solzhenitsyn had said something negative about Stalin in a recent letter. Only days later, military police would storm in and arrest Solzhenitsyn for not agreeing with the people in charge. Even though he hadn't actually done anything about it, criticizing Stalin was a capital offense. But what was Solzhenitsyn thinking when he got arrested? He wasn't thinking about his innocence or his future. He was thinking about his pride. Quote, and at the moment when my life was turned upside down and the smirsh officers at the brigade command point tore off those cursed shoulder boards and took my belt away and shoved me along in their automobile, I was pierced to the quick by worrying how, in my stripped and sorry state, I was going to make my way through the telephone operator's room. The rank and file must not see me in that condition. End quote. After reading this quote, I think to myself, why did Solzhenitsyn include this story in his book? Why include the story about how when he was arrested, he was chiefly concerned about what his subordinates would think of his disgrace? I think the answer is that Solzhenitsyn is marveling at human pride. He is marveling that shoulder boards can make a man forget about his principles of equality or justice or goodness. There's an old cliche that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But I don't think power really corrupts. I think power reveals corruption that was already there. Solzhenitsyn was always self-righteous and self-absorbed and arrogant. But once he was an officer, he had the capacity to express it in a way that was more obvious than before. But that doesn't mean he was any worse than the rest of us. You or I might be equally vicious, if we're honest with ourselves and what our character's like. Hopefully not. This is the well-read Christian podcast, after all. But circumstance and coincidence have concealed our character. So we get to pretend like we're good people and that we have good character when really we just haven't been exposed to very many challenging circumstances that might reveal our character. This is why Solzhenitsyn tells his story. He wants you to understand him because in doing so, you might just understand yourself. That's the goal of all literature, by the way. A major plot point in War and Peace centers around the disgrace of Natasha, who cheats on her fiancé and nearly elopes with another man. But because we understand Natasha's deepest desires and sympathize with her weaknesses, and we see the circumstances surrounding her fall into temptation, we don't despise her. Instead of casting her aside as a tramp, we see how human she is, and we cherish her for it, even if... We don't forgive her. That's the impact this story should have on you, too. You should see Solzhenitsyn's arrogance as an officer. You should see his pride when he's arrested. And you should be able to learn something about yourself. So after Solzhenitsyn was arrested, he was taken from the front lines and transferred deep into the heart of Russia. He was tried under Article 51, counter-revolutionary agitation, and given 10 years of forced labor. Someone's got to build the canals. And someone's got to have smaller rations. Stalin was running out of money, and slave camps were very cheap. And they were an excellent threat against those who wanted to speak out against the government. Plus, everybody's equal in prison, so they joked that it's Marx's utopia realized. But even in prison, it would take years for Solzhenitsyn to see that socialist policies were to blame for the catastrophes of the Soviet state. Even true and loyal communists were arrested and imprisoned, and they would insist that they were arrested wrongly and that the system is generally good. They were just some kind of oddball mistake. It's all just one massive error, and someone will soon discover it and release them. So they would mock and sneer at their fellow prisoners who supposedly deserved to be there. But once they met enough of each other, enough fellow true loyalists who were arrested, sometimes their idealism would fade. A notable detail about the gulags was that the guards were often prisoners themselves. If anyone didn't want to do manual labor, they could always take up arms against their fellow prisoners. Of course, those with absolutely no sense of morality would always accept this task, and they were often more brutal than the career soldiers. 
Solzhenitsyn tells the story of a former prosecutor and true communist believer who was sent to the gulags. And he was carrying a wheelbarrow full of cement one day, and he stumbled and dumped it onto the ground. Then a convicted thief, who had become a guard, began cursing at him and ordered that he pick it all up with his bare hands. The prosecutor demanded to be treated with respect because of his former position, with tears streaming down his face. But the man said that he was now an enemy of the people, and he didn't care what he did before now, only that if he didn't do exactly as he was told, he would be beat and starved. Speaking of the true loyalist, Solzhenitsyn says that, quote, To say that things were painful for them is to say almost nothing. They were incapable of assimilating such a blow, such a downfall, and from their own people, too from their dear party, and for all appearances, for nothing at all. After all, they had been guilty of nothing as far as the party was concerned. It was painful for them to such a degree that it was considered taboo among them, uncomradely, to ask, what are you in prison for? The only squeamish generation of prisoners. The rest of us in 1945, with tongues hanging out, used to recount our arrests. We couldn't wait to tell the story to every chance newcomer we met and to the whole cell, as if it was an antidote, end quote. Solzhenitsyn talks about how loyal some people were to the Communist Party, even while being actively imprisoned and tortured by them. He tells the heart-wrenching story of a woman who worked as a secretary for the Congress of an important industry. Her husband had been arrested, and so soon they'd be coming for her, and so she was fired from her job. We can't have the family of a deplorable be working for us, can we? Her husband was arrested. She must be evil. Intolerant Americans did not invent cancel culture. Communists did. Well, anyway, the police eventually come to her door, and she was more stressed about the incomplete state of a record at the office rather than her children who were about to be effectively orphaned. While she was ranting and raving and trying to get back to the office, even the chief interrogator carrying out her arrest said, Come on now. Say farewell to your children but she paid no heed. In the end, the radical left will always turn on their own because they value the collective over the individual. If one must suffer that all may benefit, then the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. What's astonishing to Solzhenitsyn is how blindly loyal people were even when it was they, even when it was they themselves and their families that were being unjustly targeted. He tells another story of a woman in prison who got a letter from her 15-year-old daughter. Uh, she was uh, just of the age to join the Komsomol, which was a political activity club for young people. Gotta train them young. The 15-year-old writes to her imprisoned mother, quote, Mama, tell me, write to me, are you guilty or not? I hope that you weren't guilty, because then I won't join the Komsomol and I won't forgive them because of you. But if you are guilty, I won't write you anymore and I will hate you. And the mother was stricken by remorse in her damp, grave-like cell with its dim little lamp. How could her daughter live without the Komsomol? How could she be permitted to hate Soviet power? Better that she should hate me. And she wrote, I am guilty. Enter the Komsomol. Solzhenitsyn goes on, How could it be anything but hard? It was more than the human heart could bear. To fall beneath the beloved axe and then to have to justify its wisdom. But that is the price a man pays for entrusting his God-given soul to human dogma. Even today, Orthodox communists will affirm that she acted correctly. Even today, they cannot be convinced that this is precisely the perversion of small forces, that the mother perverted her daughter and harmed her soul. Here's the sort of people they were. She even gave sincere testimony against her husband in court. Anything to aid the party. End quote. So what has gone wrong here? How did these people eventually end up in a place where they would rather destroy their relationships with their children and husband in order that they might maintain loyalty to a political group? How do we make sure that we are not so blindly corrupted by groupthink that we would allow political ideas to devastate the biological, psychological, and spiritual bonds between family members? Well, the answer goes all the way back to what we've been talking about in every series of the podcast leading up to this one. Nietzsche put his finger on exactly what is appealing about collectivist ideologies. God is dead, and we are alone in a cold, 
meaningless, indifferent universe. While before you believed yourself a spark of the divine, but in reality, you're a byproduct of chance and dirt. A blender of death produced the smoothie of life. And you've just got a few brief, painful years before the light goes out and your body decays into the dust from whence it came. Well, what are we going to do? How are we going to orient our lives? How will we find a purpose if all of life itself is entirely insignificant? How can I know who I am if the truth is that my sense of self is just an illusion and I'm really just an overgrown monkey? Nietzsche said that we used to have Christian metaphysics to give us satisfying answers to these questions. But now, when we are faced with these horrific truths and these questions that are now completely unanswered, people will scatter or they will collectivize. Like ants who sense their worthlessness, human beings will try to become something greater than the sum of its parts by banding together to do something great. You know what it is? It's the Tower of Babel. Genesis 11.4 Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. It's the classic story of man who senses his lack of God and decides to sacrifice his own identity and well-being in order to recover the hope and significance that he once had. Now, to be clear, this isn't happening in the individual consciousness of, of people. This is happening in our collective subconscious as deep down we scramble for answers to deep questions that we, we're not even consciously asking. We're just inheriting the answers to them from people around us, our education system, our value system, all, all kinds of things like this. And it turns out that those materialistic answers are dangerous and arrogant. Both Nietzsche and Dostoevsky said that collectivism would lead to death unlike the world had ever seen as people trample on one another to reach the pinnacle of progress. But it was Solzhenitsyn who witnessed and documented that trampling. Solzhenitsyn says that when you've traded your God-given soul for man-made dogma, you're vulnerable to groupthink because the man-made dogma allows you to continue finding identity and meaning in the collective, even when the collective is actively destroying your soul. But it doesn't matter. A loyalist will cling to their ideological arguments in order to hold on to a sense of their own rightness. Otherwise, insanity is not far off. I want to be clear here, because what I'm saying is that politics has become religion in the 20th and 21st century. It's not an original observation. Just as Nietzsche and Dostoevsky predicted, the collective disillusionment with Christianity after the, after the Enlightenment created a vacuum, an existential vacuum that needed to be filled. And since those questions of meaning and purpose and identity were no longer answered by Christianity, they became answered by politics. And that's why communism takes politics so seriously. And that's why they are willing to die for it, even when it is a communist regime that is actively killing them. Now, a few clarifications. I'm also saying that anybody can fall, fray, can fall prey to groupthink, even if you're a Christian or you believe in God. You can turn your brain off and plug yourself into any worldview uh, or, or community, I should say, and just derive a sense of purpose and identity from that community by believing the same things, uh, even though you, have, you haven't actually thought through the, the, the doctrines. You could be a Christian and be subject to groupthink. You can be a Muslim and be subjected to groupthink. Conversely, you can be a non-Christian uh, and not be a group thinker. You can be an individual who's thinking through your own whatever. Your takeaway should not be that communists are dumb, all right? Your takeaway should be that groupthink is dangerous. And if you're not humble, if you do not listen to others and sharpen your thinking, and if you do not embark on your own intellectual and spiritual journey, you will discover that your worldview is fragile because it's based on what the people around you think rather than the truth. You will be self-righteous and self-absorbed and closed-minded, and eventually life will wallop you unless you are humble and you listen to other people and not just the people in your echo chamber. All of us are prone to groupthink. We are group thinkers by default, but mature individuals need to think through their own answers to hard questions. 
assuming the conclusions of others and then turning your brain off is groupthink. Well, not quite. Well, how about you actually define groupthink, Mark? That's a good idea, right at the end of the podcast. So groupthink <laughs> is when you um, don't think for yourself, uh, when you believe certain things, not because you actually think that they're true, uh, but because you like the people around you and the people around you believe those things and you want to be identified with that group of people. All right, back to the script. Let's, let's finish this thought about the, the true loyalist. For the true loyalist, arguing for the virtues of the government was not just an interesting discussion. Politics for them was personal. The government had to be right. The party has to be right. Because they are not willing to admit that if they are wrong, then everything they are is a lie. They've built their identity on communism. They've put their hope in the revolutionaries. They believed with their whole being that what they were doing was right, that they were on the right side of history. So when the food shortages came and wages went down and the work days became longer and people start disappearing, it can't be that communism has failed. It has to be that we just aren't trying hard enough. We haven't made the right sacrifices. Wreckers and infiltrators are keeping us from our utopia. It has to be that. Something. Anything. Because if the loyalist admits that they were wrong, then they would have to break from the group and find a new identity. They'd have to find a new place for safety and significance and meaning and community. And they're unwilling to break with any of that. And so they'll make dumb arguments. And they'll rationalize and they'll justify and they'll contradict themselves and do anything so as not to threaten their standing in the group. The collective gives them everything they care about, everything that makes them human. And as long as they find meaning and identity in that group, they'll believe that capitalism is cruel and evil while actively being a slave to a communist state. You see, that's why political issues are so personal to radical leftists. Because if you challenge their ideas, you're challenging their identity, their purpose, the very thing that makes them significant, the only thing that makes them different from a monkey. And they won't question their own ideas because it's not really about the ideas. It's about finding existential answers to the deepest possible questions. And that kind of closed-mindedness can happen across the board. And so we can escape this groupthink by being humble. And that's what Solzhenitsyn learned. Humility caused him to listen to others. And listening to others made him see that he was self-righteous and self-absorbed. And he discovered that it's better to know <laughs> when you're horrifically wrong and that uh, your ideas are just grouped up in an identity. Humility gave him the courage to listen to others and humility and courage gave him the ability to grow. And that is how he broke from the groupthink and he saw the world clearer and in turn, that gave him the strength to survive the Gulag Archipelago. Thank you for listening to the World of Christian Podcast. It is an expression of your humility <laughs> and it is an expression of your desire to learn for yourself. Uh, and we'll see you next time.